the executive director of the Athenaeum. And also on the screen, we have Tess Galen, our, um, our, our wonderful events coordinator who helps make sure that everything runs smoothly. And our guest who I will brief, uh, shortly introduce. If you've never been to the Athenaeum before, I welcome all of you. We are a membership supported library research institution and a community of, uh, of, of learners, lifelong learners. And you are all welcome to join us in membership, whether you're here or in Portugal. We'd love to have you as a part of our community. We love bringing interesting and uh, uh, um, interesting uh, speakers to the Athenaeum. Sometimes they are here in person. Sometimes we are here virtually. And tonight we're pleased to have from London, Dennis Duncan with a book that was a New York Times editor's choice book and a most anticipated book of 2022 uh, as named by Literary Hub and Goodreads Index. A history, brief history, brief history. I don't know if you're <laughs> Index, a history of the, there we go, um, which I think is just a brilliant title. Uh, Dennis is a writer, translator, and lecturer in English at University College London and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. We were just talking we haven't been able to get him physically here to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia yet. And he was talking about one of his dreams is also to visit the Athenaeum in London. So we'll, we'll need to, maybe we can go over there and join you in visiting London Athenaeum. Uh, Dennis Duncan has published numerous academic books, including Book of Paris and the Ulipo and Modern Thought, as well as translations of Michel Foucault, Boris Vian and Alfred Jerry. Um, so translating from French. His writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, and The London Review of Books. And recent articles have considered uh, Meyer May and Juggs, James Joyce, and photography. And James Joyce should help us all think about Bloomsday, which is happening very soon. And we'll be celebrating with the Rosenbach here in Philadelphia in just a few weeks. Um, and uh, the history of the Times New Roman. And we are so delighted to have you here today, Dennis. I invite everybody, if you have questions any time during his talk, to put them in the Q&A. If you're on a phone and don't have the Q&A and you need to use chat, use chat. I will, um, I will help moderate those during the Q&A time. But right now, please join me in giving a virtual welcome to Dennis Duncan from London. Oh. Thanks so much, Beth, and, and thank you very, very much to, to the Athenaeum for having me. So I'm, I'm in London here. It's, it's, uh, it's 11 o'clock um, in the evening, and I'm, I'm just sitting outside my daughter's bedroom. So uh, if we do have any interruptions or if you do see a sort of spectral female figure walking behind me, don't be alarmed. This is, uh, <laughs> this is real life. It's not a ghost. It's just my daughter uh, popping out to the loo or something. So um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, hope you can, I hope you can hear all right, and I hope the connection's OK. I'm going to be talking about my book index the history of the um it's taken me quite a long time to write it took seven or eight years to write um during which time uh the thing that i would hear the most the most consistently when people heard what i was researching was history of indexes isn't that a bit niche uh and yet what i would say is i would say well we live in the age of search our phones, our tablets, our laptops, all open onto a bottomless well of information from which we can draw freely. And as we talk uh, or read or watch TV, our fingers are constantly twitching restlessly um, over our devices. What was she in? Or who did he play for? Or I thought they were dead. So when did you last use a search engine? I say, or, or when did you ask Alexa or hit control F to, to jump through um, a document? I'm gonna bring up some slides. Um, as one of Google's engineers puts it, hopefully you'll be able to see a man called Matt Cutts. Here we go. Um, can you see Matt Cutts? Uh, as Matt Cutts says, um, the first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, um, you're not actually searching the web, you're searching Google's index of the web. I'm gonna make him go away, otherwise you will end up just seeing a massive screen of slides and, and, and a, a tiny little head of mine. So I might flip between slides and non-slides um, as we go along. When you do a Google search, you're not actually searching the web, you're searching Google's index of the web. Google is an index. Uh, the history of the index is the history of how we ended up where we are now in the age of search. After all, the technology that underpins our information age can be traced back to the Middle Ages. Indexes, always 
indexes, not indices, are one of those inventions that are so successful, so integrated into our daily practices that they can often become invisible. But the next time you look something up at the back of a book or on the internet, remember that you're using a tool invented by monks in the 13th century to speed up the way that they used their books. Now, the index was invented round about the year 1230, so the early 13th century, and it's one of those inventions, the others being the light bulb or a uh, mathematical calculus, one of those inventions that's invented twice simultaneously. It's the, the moment is so ripe for these inventions that two people in different places have the same idea. Um, in the case of the index, it's invented in 1230 um, in Paris and in Oxford. I'm going to go back to my slides. This might become tiring, jumping between slides. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, it was invented in Paris by Hugh of Saint-Cher. Now, here's a, a picture of Hugh. It's a fresco um, from Italy of Hugh, who was a Dominican friar who went on to become a Dominican cardinal. We can see from the fresco that he's got the red cardinal's hat. The other thing we can see in the fresco is that he's wearing glasses. This Fresco from Italy is the first depiction of anyone anywhere in the world wearing glasses. Hugh of Saint-Cher is the first glasses wearer, only he wasn't. This is an anachronism. Hugh died about three decades too early to be wearing glasses. But the person who painted this about 100 years after his death obviously thought that Hugh was the kind of person who would wear glasses. There's something to do with his meticulousness, his reading, his eye for detail that makes him uh, uh, that makes uh, Tommaso de Modena, the, the painter, feel like he was the kind of person who would. Now, what Hugh did when he was 30 is he went to Paris and he took over as abbot of the Dominican friary at the uh, friary of Saint-Jacques, which is in Paris on the left bank, just outside where the Pantheon is today. If you've ever been to Paris and you visit the, the great big mausoleum known as the Pantheon, that in the 13th century was a, uh, a priory and Hugh got all of the monks there working on a project. And the project was to break down the Bible into its individual words, to take apart the whole Bible, list each word in the Bible and put them into alphabetical order. And for each word, about 10,000 words, all of the nouns and verbs and adjectives um, and adverbs, basically everything apart from the, the very small words, the, the twos and the uh, um, ands and things like that, 10,000 words. And for each of them, he would note where they appeared in the Bible. So each word has uh, all of the locators for it. So words like sin and God go on for pages and pages and pages because they appear loads and loads of places, whereas there's certain other words that, that are only uh, there once. But what he's done, or what he's got his, his, his friars to do, is create a word index to the Bible. So you can look up alphabetically any word in the Bible and find all of the instances for it. And the reason this is useful is because the friars, the newly created orders of preachers like the Dominicans or like the Franciscans have got to go out among the people and preach sermons. They're not like the monks of old who lived in isolated monasteries, isolated communities, never really going out into the world. The friars are created to go out and preach, to stop people straying, to stop people becoming heretics. And if you have to write sermons all the time and be engaging and be interesting, it's very useful to be able to treat the Bible like a mine of information. You're not just reading it slowly in a linear way for the rest of your life. You're thinking, I'm going to give a sermon. What am I going to, this Sunday, I'm going to give a sermon on bread. Let's look up bread, panis in the index now. It's, maybe I'll start off with the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And then to keep things interesting, to keep people on their toes, I'm going to jump back to the Old Testament, to Exodus, to the, uh, the Israelites in the desert and the manna from heaven bread of heaven and then maybe we can jump back to the new testament and the feeding of the five thousand uh, um loaves and fishes and the index allows us to, to have this sort of uh, um sparky associative uh, uh, way of uh, of using the bible what could i do there what could i add to that if i'm going to preach on whatever it is fish uh where could i go with it so hugh has created a word index of the Bible. Amazing thing about it is, is that it's incredibly compact. Um, here's a, a picture of um, a 13th century 
a word index. It's, it's called a concordance. This is this is a copy that survives in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And I've put um, an index card like like this one next to it, so you can see you can get the whole Bible, every word, and all of the places it appears into a book that's not much bigger than the, 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 uh, uh, than an index card. In other words, not much bigger than a very small tablet or a very big mobile phone. It's it's, it's an incredible achievement. Now, I said that two people invented the index. So across the channel in Oxford, we have this man, Robert Grosstest. I chose this picture of Grosstest. This is this appears at the top of a poem that he wrote. Grosstest was a bishop, a preacher, a teacher, a diplomat. He was a scientist. He was a translator. He was a philosopher. He really is the great polymath of the of the 13th century. This is an illumination that appears at the top of a copy of a poem that he wrote called the, the Chasteau d'Amour, the, the castle of love, of love. And it shows gross test. Well, we can't tell what he's doing. He's either preaching or he's telling a story and everybody is looking rapt, uh, you know, trying to catch his eye. They're all uh, going like that. Uh, they love what gross test has to say, all apart from that great big uh, seagull at the top of the picture that's that's uh, turning away. <laughs> he hasn't managed to capture the, the interest of the duck. Um, anyway, gross test, as I say, is an enormous polymath. He's read everything. He's read medicine, theology. He's read science. He, he has translated Aristotle from the Greek. Um, he's even interested in Arabic. Uh, Arabic works, the latest uh, um, Arabic science that, that that's coming into to Europe. He's he's essentially the uh, yeah the polymath of the period. In fact, we don't even know if Grosteste is his real surname. Grosteste means big head. Imagine the French gros tête. Um, uh, he might be just called that's his nickname, Robert Big Head, because he has such a capacious head. He's read everything. Um, it's quite possible that's because uh, uh, we don't know much about his background. He's just Robert, the capacious intellect, the big head. And because he's read everything, um, he needs a system to remember where he found it all. So he devises this idea, which is that he thinks about, well, what are all the things that I'm interested in? All of the concepts that I'm interested in. And he comes up with a list of about 400 themes or topics, he calls them, um, that, that he's interested in in his reading. And for each of these topics, he designs a little symbol, a tiny little easy to, uh, easy to write symbol, like an emoticon. And as he reads, every time he comes across one of these ideas, he just does the symbol for it in the margin. Here is the margins of one of his books. So you can see all of his books, some of his, his own copies of his own books still survive. Again, this is, this is, this is from Oxford. Um, and we can see running down the left-hand side, these symbols. Um, he would do dot, 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 three little dots in a triangle uh, for the idea of the Trinity. He would do a picture of a, a flower, a little uh, four-leaf flower for the idea of the imagination and so on. So running down like a stream of emoticons down the margin would be all of the ideas that appear in a book. And what he, what he can do after that is copy out the locations that each of these ideas appear. So he has a, another book, a grand table, the grand tabula of Robert Grosteste, where once he's done his reading, he will go, well, where are all the times that imagination appeared? And he'll go to his imagination page and he'll flip through the book, running his finger down the margin. Oh, I see it was in Aristotle on page, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I see it was in St. Augustine there. And what we end up with in a single manuscript that survives nowadays in Lyon in France is Robert Grosteste's grand tabula. He's the man who's read everything and the list of where it all appears, all of the ideas in all of the works of the 13th century um, and before, basically like a, a sort of single parchment Google. So what we have are two types of index here. In Paris, we have the, the word index, which I think we can associate with, with something like control F. As long as you know the exact word you're looking for, you can jump through a document, in this case, the Bible, looking for every instance of that thing, just like you can jump through a web page or jump through a PDF. What Gross Test has done is the subject index. Now, it doesn't matter if the writer uses exactly this word, because, of course, Gross Test can read French and Latin and Greek and English. Um, so people aren't using the same word every, anyway. But if the concept appears, it's like the, the index in the back of a book 
where a human indexer has, has, has written an index of all of the themes, topics, or concepts that appear. So gross tests is a subject index, um, and, uh, and Hugh of Sancher, here we go, here's Hugh, has given us the, uh, the word index. I'm gonna tell you one of the problems of the medieval index. So these both become incredibly popular. I'm just gonna have a sip of this, just pure vodka. Um, um, the index catches on in the 13th century. So we find indexes in all sorts of books pretty much as soon as it's been invented. But there is a problem um, because until printing arrives about 200 years later, books might have the same words in them, but not on the same pages. We have a problem then because every copy of every book until the 1450s is literally a copy. It has been copied out by hand by a monk. If, I, if you have a book and I think that looks good, can I have one? You'll lend it to me and I'll take it to a monk and he'll spend several months copying out every word in it, copying it out by hand. This is what manuscript means. Manuscript means hand written manuscript. Um, the thing is they'll concentrate on making sure they get the words correct, but they might be copying from a big book into a little book, in which case you go from having sort of uh, all of St. Augustine on 400 pages to all of St. Augustine on 800 pages or vice versa. Do you see what I mean? So we have a problem of um, the index, if you're going to key it to page numbers, only works for that copy of the book. Otherwise, you're going to have to rekey it. You're going to have to go through. Um, give you an example. So this is a manuscript in a library in Cambridge, in St. John's College, Cambridge. Um, it's a history book. It's written in the 1350s by a man called Ranulf Higdon, uh, a monk from central England in the 1350s. The copy in Cambridge is from the 1380s. So somebody else has copied it about 30 years later. It's a history of the world. It's called the Polychronicon, a history of the world from the time of the creation uh, through the stories of the Iliad. It kind of mixes uh, what we now think of uh, as, as fiction and history. So the stories of the Iliad, the stories of the Bible, and then uh, the Norman conquest and, and Edward II and stuff like that. History of the world from the creation right up till uh, the 1350s. This actual copy um, in, in Cambridge belonged to various people. We can see it belonged to John Dee in, in the time of Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth's magician there, John Dee, has signed it at the top, Johannes Dee, 1573. He's a spooky man, but we're not interested in him, so he's going to disapparate now. What I'm interested in is the man who did the actual copying. And this is a monk called John Lutton. If you see the little bit I've magnified down at the bottom, this is the last page of the history. This is the very end of the history. And right at the bottom, at the end, he's put, uh, qui scripsit librum uh, John Luttonum est sibi nomen. Uh, the person who wrote this book, John Lutton, is his name. This is a thing that copyists often did. They spent so long, they spent literally months copying this thing out. And when they get to the end, they sign it like an artist. The guy who wrote this is called John Lutton. He's literally signed it. Trouble is, he's then realized, oh, I haven't done the index yet. So he signed his name, John Lutton, and then he started another column. We've got these two great big illuminated A's here. The second A is the start of the index, all of the words that start with A. The, the first one here is, is a kind of how to, it's a, it's a paragraph on how to use an index. These things are new enough that people need a description telling them how to use it. And what he says is, First of all, note the leaf numbers in the top right corners. These represent the number of each written leaf. There's something slightly tautologous about it. And he says, then consult the table wherever you please. So look up whatever you want in the alphabetical table. For example, Alexander destroyed the city of Tyre, except for the family of Strato, 72, two, three. The number 72, indicates the leaf where such a number, 72, is written in the corner as discussed further up. And by rooting out that number, the said matter of Alexander and Strato will be found. So what he's doing, and it seems so sort of intuitive to us how, how to use an index. You look up your thing, it gives you a number, that's the page number. This is how you describe it in, in the midi, Middle Ages. Um, that number indicates the page number. So if you look up 72, then you will find the thing that you looked up. Thing is though, I went to page 72 
And could I find Alexander and Strato? No, I couldn't. In fact, that big S there, that illuminated S, this is page 72, you see I've circled it up at the top. And the big S there is the start of the name Seleucus. Seleucus is one of Alexander's successors. By the time we get to page 72, Alexander has been dead for years. This is all about Seleucus. What's going on? So I find I have to flick back. Did he even go to Tyre? Sure enough, when I get to page 66, there it is. What's happened is that John Lutton has copied out the whole index, including the page numbers. Poor old John Lutton down here, John Lutton wrote this book, doesn't know how an index works. And he's literally just copied it out number for number until some later people, later people using this book have had to scratch away the parchment. And you can see where underneath the numbers here, the way the parchment goes darker because people have had to scrape off the top layer of skin. This is before paper. This is all written on, on animal skin. Scrape off the top layer of skin and write in the correct numbers. The whole index, as John Lutton prepared it, is basically like if you have a web page and every link you click goes to 404 page not found. And it's all because of the problem of manuscripts. Now, if John Lutton had only survived for another 50 years, he would have been around in time for the invention of printing. Printing is remarkable. What printing does is it means every book is essentially the same, as long as it comes from the same print run. I can send one to you, Tess, and I can send one to you, Beth, and I can be sitting here in London, and you can be in Philadelphia, and I can go, you're going to love what's on page 17, knowing that your page 17 is, is you're going to love uh, uh, um, page 72, where Alexander arrives at the city of Tyre, um, and know that it really does happen on, on page 72. We can all be on the same page after printing. So I'm showing you a page here from a sermon. This is a printed sermon. Do you know what? I might actually just break off and read a bit from the book. Is this okay if I do a little bit of reading? I'm going to describe what's going on here. I'm in the Bodleian Library in Oxford with a small printed book open on the desk in front of me. That's the one here. This is the text of a sermon and it was printed in 1470 in Cologne at the print shop of a man called Arnold Tohernan. The book is no larger than uh, a paperback, like that. Um, and the text itself is short, just 12 leaves or 24 pages. But sitting here in the library with the book before me and opened on its first page is, I think, the most intense experience that I've had of the archival sublime, the sense of disbelief that something so significant, something of such conceptual magnitude should be here on my desk among my own workaday effects, a laptop, notebook, pencil. It feels astonishing that I should be allowed to pick it up, hold it, turn its pages as though it were a novel I'd purchased at the train station. Why is it not under glass, sealed off, labelled and exhibited where crowds of school children might look but not touch? There's a name for this feeling, Stendhal syndrome, after the French novelist, who on a visit to Florence described the palpitations he experienced at being so close to the tombs of the Renaissance masters. I feel like I'm on the verge of tears. The sermon was written by Werner Rollevink, a monk from the Cologne Charter House. Rollevink would become famous for writing the Fasciculus Temporum, or the Little Bundle of Dates, a history of the world. It's another history of the world, like the Polychronicon, uh, a, a, a history of the world from the first day of the creation to the bleeding edge of the present. Uh, in this case, the 3rd of May, 1481, the date on which Wollavink tells us the Ottoman emperor, Mehmet II, went to hell for his wickedness against Christianity. But the lengthy and complex fasciculus was still a work in progress when Wollavink penned this short sermon to be preached on the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the 21st of November. If the truth be told, however, it's neither Rollovink nor his preaching that make this book special for me. It's something else, something about the book itself. There, in the right-hand margin, halfway down, a single large capital J. The ink has bled slightly, uh, the impression slightly too strong, so the letter's a little bit smudgy, without the detail and clarity of the Gothic lettering in the main text block. Nevertheless, I love this J all the more 
for its blurriness. I'd rather it was this way, characterful, let's call it, than the other J. Do you see it? Crystalline, uh, a perfect impression, just to the left of it in the main text, the initial of the word Joachim. Our marginal J has nothing to do with Joachim. It's pure coincidence they appear side by side like this. In fact, our J is not really a J at all, it's a numeral. It's the number one announcing that this is the first leaf of the book. RJ is the first printed page number. It will revolutionize the way that we use books. And in doing so, it will become such a commonplace that it will disappear from view almost, hiding in plain sight at the edge of every page. I love this little book so much. Imagine what stems from, oh, hello there. Uh, <laughs> Tess's cat. Imagine what stems from this J. Every time we uh, cite a reference, every time we ask our students to put at the bottom of their essays each page number for each quotation, every time we use an index, every time we tell each other you're going to love what's on page 72, we're, we're using the innovation of this little printed sermon this letter J, all of a sudden indexes are viable for every type of book. Every type of book can have page numbers and indexes can key themselves, not to uh, a chapter and verse, but to page numbers. And they can be useful across an edition. An index can apply not just to a single book, but to a whole print run. Suddenly indexes are everywhere. Within the next 40 or 50 years, we find indexes, uh, I'm talking about around the turn of the 1500s, indexes appear in history books, uh, religious books, medicine books, uh, recipe books, in hymn books, every single kind of book you can imagine. Um, there's a moment here, this is uh, Orlando Furioso. You might know it, uh, uh, the great, um, Italian epic poem of the early 16th century. This is a hippogriff. If you've read uh, Harry Potter, um, where they fly about on hippogriffs, uh, she gets that from Orlando Furioso. And this is a picture of a, of a hippogriff from the early 16th century. Anyway, in this book, there's a moment early on where the English knight, Astolfo, is given a spell book by a fairy. And a bit like Chekhov's gun, we can imagine that he's going to need it. And sure enough, a few chapters later, he finds himself needing to cast a spell. Um, but how does he know how to find the spell? Well, he took his book and searcheth in the table how to dissolve the place he might be able. And straight in the index for it, he doth look of palaces framed by such strange illusion. That's a, a 16th century translation of a 16th century um, uh, Italian book, but even in the Italian, the word index, indice, is there. So by the start of the 1500s, even fairy spell books come equipped with indexes. Now, this you might think is great. How useful, but not everybody feels so excited. Not everybody is on board with this. I'm going to show you something. Uh, here are some people who don't like indexes. You might recognize this. This is a tweet. Um, I was able to find a screenshot of the first tweet. Um, it's actually a sort of compound tweet that, that there's, there's an extension. But the second part I wasn't able to find a screenshot for because as you may or may not know, uh, this person tweets are no longer available. So I had to type out the quotation um, myself. All of that might change now, who knows? Um, anyway, he says, Google search results for Trump news shows only the viewing reporting of fake news media. In other words, they have it rigged for me and others so that almost all stories and news is bad. Fake CNN is prominent. He goes on, Google and others are suppressing the voices of conservatives. They're controlling what we can and cannot see. So we have an idea that Google, which I say, as I said earlier, is an index. Now this index isn't transparent. What if the person who's providing the index isn't being fair, isn't uh, truly representing the, the database, isn't truly reflecting that the big data this, uh, in this case, actually, this was disproved by The Economist shortly after, but um, this is an anxiety that goes back as far as we want to go, along with certain other anxieties. Here is um, a message from the end of a book in 1665. 
on uh, the book ends on page 256 on page 257 we get bookseller to the reader the reason why there's no table or index added here unto is that every page in this work is so full of signal remarks that were they couched in an index it would make a volume as big as the book and so make the post and gate to bear no proportion with the building in other words um, the index would have to be the map would have to be as large as the territory if you like the index would have to be exactly as, as big as the book because everything here is important what the person that the printer here realizes is that in any index there is compression there is uh, decision making there's, there's choices of, of what to uh, keep in what to index what to leave out some things get left out and this is a cause of anxiety some other people Erasmus the great European intellectual in 1532 writes a little book in the form of an index it takes the form of, of, of a long table um, and in the preface, he says, well, I had to do this because these days, many people only read the title and the index. These days, people are only reading the index. They don't bother to read the whole book because the index contains all of the useful stuff. Galileo says the same thing 100 years later. He says that herd who, in order to learn how matters such as this take place, do not betake themselves to ships or crossbows or cannons, but retire to their studies and glance through an index to see whether Aristotle said so people are lazy they don't do the research anymore this is uh, repeated by Thomas Fuller in England 1662 there's a lazy kind of learning which is only indical when scholars like adders that only bite the horses hooves um, nibble but at the tables neglecting the body of the book so there's this anxiety that people aren't going to read properly anymore not only might indexes not truly represent the book uh, uh, fairly, but also people might not read. If you give them just an index that contains all the important things, what's the point of reading the whole book anymore? It's similar to a present anxiety about uh, uh, the, the index uh, of our time. Is Google making us stupid? says Nicholas Carr, is there, there's an idea around that we don't read properly because searching allows us just to raid texts for the morsels that are useful to us. So I just want to show that actually that anxiety goes back as far as you want. That anxiety goes back to, to the birth of the index, essentially. It's been around as long as there have been indexes. The other thing that happens is that when you have a technology that becomes familiar when people stop having to write how to paragraphs at the top of an index and everybody knows what it is um, people start to play with it start to play off it now at the turn of the 1700s so the, the, the we're talking about 1698 essentially here we have the index becoming weaponized and this will relate both to the anxiety about people not reading anymore and the the trump anxiety about well the index not being a fair reflection of the work. What happens is um, a young man called Charles Boyle publishes an edition of some classical Greek, supposed to be the, the epistles of Phalaris, a dictator from an island in the Mediterranean in the early fifth century BC. Now Richard Bentley, the great scholar Richard Bentley, reviews this and says, well, this is all very well, but he doesn't mention the fact that these are forgeries. These can't be from the fifth century BC. And Bentley points to various moments in the text where the language is slightly too modern, the version of Greek is slightly too modern, or the text mentions a city that we know was only founded in the third century BC, things like that. Min minute textual details, uh, a, a sort of forensic analysis. And he says, Boyle hasn't even realized that these uh, letters are false. Now, Boyle and his aristocratic friends from Christchurch in Oxford go mad at this. They're furious. They say that that type of analysis is pedantic. Bentley could only perform this type of analysis by using word lists, by using alphabetical tables like the Bible concordance. He's an index scholar. How dare he? He's not like us gentleman scholars who, who feel passionately about literature. He's a dry as dust pedant. And they publish this book called Dr. Bentley's Dissertations on the Epistles of Phalaris Examined. Now, they can't really uh, take issue with Bentley's evidence because he's correct, but they certainly can take issue with Bentley himself, his class, 
he's lower class than them, his pedantry. And what they do, because they call him an index scholar, this is the worst type of scholarship. They write an index of Bentley's personality, a short account of Dr. Bentley by way of index. So this is the first time that the index has become weaponized, has been used as a satirical tool. So the index at the back of this book is all about the things that are wrong with Dr. Bentley, his egregious dullness, page 74, 106, and so on. His pedantry, lots on that, pages 93 to, to 99. His appeal to foreigners. There's a, there's a thing that you had in the, the 1690s, and I, I, I fear we're getting now in the 2020s in this country where there's a suspicion of foreigners. An appeal to foreigners could possibly be a bad thing, page 13. His collection of asinine proverbs, his familiar acquaintance with books that he never saw. All of this is a kind of spoof, a kind of joke about Bentley, the index scholar. Um, but actually, this is an index to the book about what a terrible person Bentley is. And it actually works. We could look up um, his familiar acquaintance with books that he never saw, page 76, and find that's exactly what they're discussing there. Um, but all of this uh, gives rise to a spate of attack indexes. Over the next 10 or 15 years, it becomes fashionable when your political rival brings out a book, you bring out an index to it, mocking all of the moments where it gets things a bit wrong or it has sloppy grammar or is a bit too friendly to the Pope or things like that. We get the attack index as a sort of fashion of the early 1700s. The man who did this index, a man called William King, likes his invention so much that he takes aim at the, oh, just a few more things, uh, some of the things they accuse Bentley of, but these are all to do with being an index scholar. He's a second-hand critic. You see, he doesn't read the text themselves. He just reads the index of the text. This is alphabetical learning. You get that, you know, he's looking things up in an alphabetical table. It has all the pomp and show of learning without the reality. This isn't proper learning. Um, they say any person by the aid of uh, leisure or lexicons, that's dictionaries can set up for a critic, but I take index hunting to be the lowest diversion a man can betake himself to. But the satirical index has become a thing at this point. So, oh, more, more early 18th century gripes at index learning. I won't, I won't go into those, but we can see Jonathan Swift or Gulliver's Travels um, has a go at them. Uh, these are men who pretend to understand a book by scattering through the index, uh, as if you were uh, describing a palace when all you'd seen was the, the privy or the toilet and so on. Alexander Pope, the great poet says, index turning turns no student pale. There's the idea that students should be going pale. They should be staying up late, like me, burning the candle at both ends, turning themselves pale. But if they just use the index, these students aren't going pale enough. Now we get William King, uh, taking aim at the transactions of the Royal Society. Now he thinks that the journal published by the Royal Scientific Institution, the Royal Society, um, is silly. He thinks that the journal doesn't have a strong enough editorial policy. It publishes uh, petty things that, that readers can just send in. And in order to demonstrate this, he publishes a pamphlet where he simply quotes these things verbatim. And the idea is that he will show you by not changing these, but just quoting them. This is ridiculous. Can you believe that the august journal of the Royal Society would publish this nonsense? But it has a very good index. Um, I'll give you an example. Here's something that William King quotes in the transaction here. This really did appear in the transactions of the Royal Society a couple of years earlier. It's a man who has written in to the Royal Society about something he encountered when he was walking in Cornwall. In my itinerary from London to Margaret Island, and thence most by the seashore to Land's End to observe what plants each part produced, between Penzance and Mackitchew lived one Charles Worth, an apothecary, who causing a pie to be made of the said poppy, you can see what's gonna happen here. We all know what happens if you uh, 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 misuse the, the seeds of the poppy. Um, and eating of the said poppy pie whilst hot, he was presently taken with a kind of delirium, as made him fancy that most that he saw was gold. And calling for a chamber pot, um, being a white earthen chamber pot, um, and having purged by stool into it, purged, 
you see what he's getting at here, uh, having uh, um, purged himself by stool into, <laughs> into the chamber pot, he broke it into pieces and bid the bystanders to save them, for they were all gold, he said. Um, but these were not all the effects of the papava, the coniculated poppy, um, for the man and the maid servants, having also eaten of the same poppy pie, stripped themselves quite naked and danced uh, one against another a long time. The wife wasn't in on this. The mistress, who had gone to market, coming home and saying, how now? What is here to do? The maid turned her britch against her and purging stoutly said, there, mistress, is gold for you. So <laughs> what's gone on in this scene? Well, the index summarizes this as Charles Worth, his man and maid, all merrily be shat, page 39. Other things, <laughs> you couldn't put it more succinctly, other things in the index are a china ear picker, page 15. Picking the ears too much, dangerous on the same page. That men can't swallow when they're dead, page 28. You see what he's doing. These stories are so ridiculous. In summarizing them in, in, in an index like this just gives the lie to how stupid some of these things in the, the transactions are. Hogs that shite soap, page 66. Cows that shite fire, page 67. Mr. Ray's definition of a dildo, page 11. God, if you think we invented swearing in the 1960s, you, you have a, a, another thing coming when you read some of these things. Um, so the, uh, the sort of satirical or weaponized index really emerges around about 1700, and it's still with us. There are some really nice um, examples of snark in indexes these days. Um, there's a lovely book of, of, of bad poetry, which uh, sort of satirizes all the moments that great poets write terrible lines. This is uh, a poem by Wordsworth. And the index says, Dewsbury, Miss Cheats Time with Stuffed Owl, page 151. This is the uh, historian, uh, 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 Hugh Trevor Roper, who famously would, would uh, bury sort of snide attacks on his colleagues in the index, like this one. Peterhouse College, high table conversation, not very agreeable, page 46. Main source of perverts, page 113. Imagine seeing that and then going to dinner with Hugh Trevor Roper at the high table. Or uh, oh, this is this is my favourite. This is from a, a recent book on British politics. The Tory politician Jonathan Aitken, disgraced politician from the 1990s. Aitken, Jonathan, admires risk takers, 59, goes to jail, 60. So index snark is alive and well. The thing that people told me a lot, the anecdote I heard the most, when people heard I was writing this book, concerned these two. This is William F. Buckley Jr. and Norman Mailer, uh, the pugnacious Norman Mailer. It wasn't hard to find a picture of Mailer in boxing pose. I couldn't find one for, for, for Buckley, but this is a, another controversy. They were sort of frenemies in the, in the mid 60s, both public intellectuals. Um, William F. Buckley was a, a notable right wing public intellectual in, in the 60s. And in the race for New York mayor in, I think, 1965, Buckley decided to enter. Now, he didn't have a chance. This is really a publicity stunt, stunt. Um, but the, the, the uh, um, public intellectual TV personality, William Buckley, entered the race for mayor, and he lost. Um, he was never going to win. He made the whole thing sort of interesting, though. Uh, um, somebody asked him at one point, uh, what would you do if you won? And he said, I demand a recount. Uh, so it was, it was never on the cards he was going to win. But when he lost, um, he went away for a year and he wrote a book about it called The Unmaking of a Mayor. And in the process of writing that book, he wrote to Norman Mailer to say, I'd like to quote some of our correspondence between us. Do you mind if I include that? And Mailer wrote back and said, yes, I do mind. And no, you can't use it. So when the book came out, Buckley uh, mentions this conversation. He says, I'm sorry, at this stage, uh, I can't quote Norman Mailer because he won't let me. And when the book came out, he sent a copy to Norman Mailer. And in the index at the back, against the entry for Mailer, Norman, in a red ballpoint pen, he wrote, hi, exclamation mark. The joke being that he knows that the first thing that Mailer is going to do is turn to the back and see if he's in it. This is this is called the Washington Read now. This is uh, politicians in DC famously go into bookshops and take down the latest political memoirs, look at the back to see if they're in it, 
and only buy it if they are. This is the, the, the origin of the Washington Reed is, is Buckley versus Mailer. This nice little joke about Mailer's narcissism is that I've seen you, I've caught you in the act of looking yourself up. Hi, and here it is, hi. The thing that I like so much about this story is like I say, when I was writing the book, loads of people said, oh, you know about the, the Buckley Mailer thing? And so many people said it, that I ended up not believing it. I thought, well, this is probably one of those kind of urban myths. In fact, lots of people told me it was different people. It was Gore Vidal and blah, blah, blah. It was a story that sort of circulates with interchangeable people. Um, but at one point during the writing of the book, I heard uh, by chance that on his death, Norman Mailer's library was preserved. And in fact, it, it, it's uh, preserved in Austin, Texas at the Harry Ransom Center. So on the off chance, I wrote to the librarian and I said, you don't happen to have a Norman Mailer's copy of a book called The Unmaking of a Mayor, do you? And he wrote back and said, yes, actually we do. And I said, you couldn't go to the back and, and see if anyone's written in the index. And he said, yeah, there is, there's, there's a um, little note against his own name. Hi. And so what I love about this story is so many people told it to me and it turns out to be true. And I got the librarian to take a picture of it. Um, so <laughs> I never really believed it would be, it would be possible that it would be true. Um, but when you bring out a book, when I brought out my book, every image that you use, it's got lots of images of, 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 of library books and indexes and things like that. Every image that you use, you need to pay for the rights to uh, um, to use it. You need to contact the library um, and uh, pay a fee for, for, using an in, uh, uh, for using an image. So I got in touch with the library in Texas and said, would you mind um, if I reproduce that image? And the librarian was very kind. He said, no, I don't mind at all. And you can do it for free. The only thing is, um, because it has a single word written on it in handwriting, it's not just our image, it's a, it counts as a William F. Buckley unpublished manuscript, uh, even though it's only a one word manuscript. So it's, it's all right for me to say you can use the image, but you would need to clear it with the Buckley estate. Um, Buckley's not alive, but you need to get permission. So I had to write to Christopher Buckley, his son, and say there's a one word manuscript by your father. Um, would it be all right if I reproduced it in my book? And Christopher Buckley was very kind. And he said, yeah, no, that's fine. You can use that. But when the book comes out, I'd like you to send me a copy of it. And sure enough, I, I, when the book was printed in January in, in, in New York, I asked my publishers to send him a copy of it. But just before it went out, I had a brainwave. And I thought, well, we're not just going to send it out like that. Against his father's name, we need to get a red ballpoint pen and write, hi. <laughs> Just to make sure that the long history, the 300 year history of uh, index snark uh, carries on. So I think that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I've not seen you properly. Um, I've had my slides up, but that will uh, that will do for now. Um, yeah, hopefully some people might have some questions. Thank you. This is wonderful. And uh, yeah, I Jeffrey has is, is, uh, sent some laughing emojis. Um, that, that was just a wonderful, wonderful story. We do remind you all to put questions in the Q&A or the chat, and I will, um, I will make sure that we, we ask Dennis these questions. Uh, first, Michael is curious, uh, great question. What's the, what's the, the history of um, the word index? Where did it come from? Gosh, I, I think it comes from the finger. Uh, um... I, th I think uh, the thing that leads you in, uh, have I got that right? I, I, you know what, I should be much better at this, um, but I think the finger comes first. <laughs> <for>, uh, <laughs> um, do you know what, but the, the history of the, the, the index being a name for, for that thing at the back of a book is quite a curious one. In the period I've been talking about, the late middle ages, um, the early indexes are called all sorts of things. They're called tables, they're called um, syllabuses, they're called a, a, a margarita, they're called a pie, um, all sorts of strange names for it. Index only sort of settles down quite late. In fact, throughout most of the, the 1500s, you see index and table being used um, interchangeably. Now we tend to mean a table as, as, as the thing at the front of the book, an index as the thing at the back. Um, but uh, the um, early meaning of, of the word index, when it appears in 
Latin. The first use of the word index in, in the sort of Latin classical corpus is a letter from Cicero. Uh, and it's to a friend of his called Atticus. And what's happened is, you can see my bookshelf behind me, um, Cicero has liked Atticus's bookshelves. And Atticus says, well, you know, uh, um, I can help you with that. And I'll send some slaves round to uh, help you put labels. Now we're talking, th this is before books are like this. This is called a codex, this kind of folding book. But when books were still scrolls and you would store them in your bookshelf like this, but they'd all be like that. Um, how do you know what's in them? Well, you have a little tag coming out so you can go, oh, this is, this is Homo or whatever it is. And that tag is called in Latin, an index. And in Greek, um, it's called a syllabus. Uh, which is where we get our, our word syllabus. If you want to know what's in my course, here's the syllabus and so on. So the syllabus is the, the, is the little little tag that tells you what's in something. Um, and so, uh, uh, oh, what was I going to say? In, index initially meant the, the, the tag on your scroll that would tell you what's in it. So did, so did the word syllabus. Um, and then it comes to mean the, the, the sort of table at the back that tells you what's, what's in the book. Thank you. So um, Sherman notes that the term indexical is used a lot in art history and criticism. And if you know, if you have any thoughts about how that's used in critical theory, indexical. Oh, yeah, I'm 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 a bit hopeless on on the critical theory. Uh, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, I'm not going to. I'm Sherman. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to have a very good answer for this. Isn't this this comes from the. Um, is, is it the, the uh, um, semiotician, 19th century semiotician, who talks about different types of representation? There's the iconic, there's the indexical. The iconic represents something by uh, um, sort of symbolizing aspects of it. And indexical is a different type of sort of pointing relationship. I'm, uh, uh, um, I'm entirely the wrong person. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Sorry, stumped you. Fierce. And, and Charles sounded fierce, isn't it? Indexical is, 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 a, is a word that, that we, we get sort of via the sort of mid century uh, um, critical theorists from, from Pierce's theory of language, I think. Um, but but that's, that's, a, that's a rubbish answer. Sorry. Sorry. That's another book, Sherman, that may be your book to write. <laughs> history of indexical <laughs> um so real quickly before another question deborah said you know it's an absolutely marvelous talk and she just bought both your book and the buckley book so oh have, have them both there um so few people steven jamie tess are all sort of interested in, in how indexes are created now are they computer generated or yeah, that's, what's, that's what's right i just saw this lovely question from from stephen marman are, are there computer software programs that can do an index um and that's a that's a really good question um there are and i really wanted to show this in in my book um there are but i think that the those software programs that produce an index um currently are not very good. And I, I had a book, um, I haven't got it on my shelf, but I, I did a book a few years ago and the publisher sent it back to me and it had an index um, and they asked me to sign off and, and the index was terrible. And it was a book, a book about translation. It's called Babel, Adventures in Translation. It was the, the catalog book for an exhibition. And then un, un, under the T's, it said translation page 118. The whole book was about trans, how did it get? <laughs> but also another funny thing about that index is, um, a lot of things, um, mostly it was just an index of names, just proper names, th things that start with capital letters. And it included some stupid words that started with capital letters just because they're at the start of a sentence. And so it obviously there was some sort of part of the algorithm that just looked up any old thing that started with a capital letter. Um, so when I came to write this book about indexes, the history of indexes, I wanted to see, well, what's the state of the art in this um, uh, sort of automatically generated. Some of them use kind of rudimentary AI um, indexes. So at the back of my book, I've got two indexes. And the first one is generated by a piece of software. And in fact, I had to do it twice. Um, the first time I did it, it was so bad that I thought this can't be right. This is this is too this is too good. This is too silly. Um, I showed you a slide earlier of Hugh of Saint Cher, the, uh, the the French um, cardinal who. who 
made the first index to the Bible. Um, in the computer generated index, I was just looking through it and it mentioned um, Sher, C-H-E-R. I thought, well, what's she doing in this? But but anyway, in the first few chapters, there were lots and lots of references to, to Sher. And I was thinking, what, do you believe in life after love? I, I, I didn't, um, I, and what it had done was it has just taken Sher and, and stuck it in the index. And I, I thought that was, oh, well, that's just too terrible. So I ended up having to find um, another piece of software to, to see if it was any better. And actually the, the second piece of software was slightly better. Um, and I've included, it as an example, but all it can do is pull out phrases. What it, it pulls out thousands of words and phrases. Um, age finding, six. Uh, amusement, mere, page 198. So basically anything that starts with, with an A. And they're all um, alphabet by singing, amateur scientists, ambitions, early, stuff like that. Um, essentially every single word, and it's not really useful. So the second index, the proper index, is an index that was compiled by a lady called Paula Clark Bain, a professional indexer, member of the Society of Indexers um, in, in Manchester, in England. And Paula is a sort of long-standing indexer, but she's also learning how to compile crosswords. And so that the index really sort of sings, it's full of useful things. If there's anything that you want to look up in my book, then it will be there. But it also has loads of Paula's personality. I think she thought that the book was quite fun um, slightly whimsical, and so she's generated, she's generated, she's compiled a sort of fun whimsical index that has acrostics and anagrams and little word games and stuff running through it, and is a kind of masterpiece in its own right. So in answer to that question about um, com computers compile indexes, yes they can, but but at the moment um, not very well, certainly not as well as a, as a, as a good well-trained um, human indexer and I've, I've put both in my book in order to demonstrate sort of where we're at they'll only get better I mean computers are coming for for, for all of our jobs um, but uh, but I think the one thing that humans will will be able to do is, is what Paula has done which is sort of imbue an index with with, with personality um, I can't see a point when when the, the automatically generated one will be able to do that so as we know uh, you know when you're a a graduate student or getting your first book out, often it's you're, you're compiling your, your index yourself. And if you're a senior scholar, you may hire graduate students yeah. or you know, professional writer, you will get a, a professional indexer. Um, but so you talk about uh, Hugh Cher and uh, St. Cher and, and how he had his whole community was creating an index. Yeah, so that's in the right. early, Yeah, so in the early years, was it more likely to be a group of people creating an index or was it a solo project from what what did you find in your research by and large it's a solo project uh, um i mean to do a word index of the bible is is a lot more labor intensive than than what gross test is doing which is which is his personal index of the uh, of his own reading so so it's really only certain um certain types of index uh, and and they're fairly few that lend themselves to sort of communal work um Far more often, it's it, it, it's a sort of solo thing. It's quite interesting. The um, certain medieval manuscripts are preserved in the in the bindings of books. So some of you might know this, but but if you take a well, if you take a hardback book like like mine, um, it's hardback because it's got you know hard card there, and historically that would be made by getting old parchment, old, old paper, scrap paper, things that that were soiled or or, or um, uh, had misprints on compacting that and so so books were bound inside um, uh, inside other books and if we take those books apart we find medieval manuscripts some of which don't exist in any other form and in the 1700s uh, a book was sort of dismantled and the notes for the first index were found so before the first index the the sort of the, the rough working version and what you find is the handwriting changing between letters so it, so it looks like that the work was divvied up you do the s's you do the t's you do the v's because when we get to a, a letter boundary um we get the sort of handwriting changing so it's really interesting to see that sort of division of labor within within the friary um but uh, it's a uh, it's a good question beth but mostly it's not like that mostly it's it's um individual indexes. So now Catherine Dean um, says, you know, loving this conversation, she says she's um, 
a librarian archivist working on an index with her student workers, which currently exists in a very tedious spreadsheet format, um, which they go through page by, as they go page by page through 40 volumes of local newspaper clippings. So, <laughs> So she might need to share this with them to uh, inspire them. We have one last question, and that is why the plural of index is not indices. Oh, that's a really good question, um, because Shakespeare says so. Um, so in, in Troilus and Cressida, uh, Shakespeare anglicizes the plural. And uh, since then, since the 19th century, I think there's been a convention that, that for indexes, we say, well, if it's, if it's good enough for Shakespeare, um, it'll be good enough for us. So indices are for uh, mathematicians and economists and indexes. Of what you find at the back of a book. Wonderful. Well, this is so fantastic. I had several people have said they've bought your book while on this talk. And hey. for all of you, buy it for yourself. You know, you, as you as you see, it's going to be an enjoyable read. Graduations are right around the corner. And what better way to celebrate someone reaching a milestone in their education oh. than by giving a book that's going to be fun to read and they're going to learn something. And if not, they can at least just look at the index. <laughs> and grab what they want, right? Um, we thank you all for coming tonight. We invite you to come back again for um, upcoming this Sunday. We have one more ticket left if anybody wants to come from uh, Sweden or Portugal or London and join us at Opera Philadelphia for Rigoletto. Um, we also next next Wednesday will be with Dennis Drabel and uh, Sean Ehring on uh, Dennis Drabel's book, How America's Best Idea in National Parks Came to Fruition. I hope you will join us for that. Uh, and our pop-up uh, artist uh, uh, exhibit and uh, fun reception on Friday, first Friday of May. Come join us in person. So these are all in-person events, but I hope you can join us if you're able to. We have more online. You can find that at our events. And Dennis, this is just truly delightful. So grateful to you. So grateful to your daughter for, you know, letting her <laughs> dad take over the living room while she's trying to sleep. Um, it, it, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Everybody have a wonderful, wonderful evening. We'll see you all again soon.